you very much. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, I'm focusing on, we now have two interesting lines of work in the lab and I'm focusing on the first, uh, largely because um, we're specifically looking for people who are, um, who want to work on, um, on this aspect of the system. So we're now looking at the, the neural basis of um, uh, acoustic communication systems in Orthoptera. And um, so if any of you are interested in this stuff, please contact me. So I'll start with my recruiting pitch. Um, and then uh, get into the system. Uh, how long do I have, Shraddha? Just so I do a time check. Five minutes. So 45 minutes. 45 uh, okay. yeah. All right, so that's a good amount of time. Um, I will, uh, I, you know, we'll, we'll see uh, uh, how, how long um, I take. And I'm really interested in, in questions and answers always. So, um, so we'll wait for that. Okay, so, um, uh, you know, I work on this absolutely beautiful system uh, and I'm, I'm really privileged in some ways to, to work on these animals. Um, and I, I look at essentially songs, which are a means of communication um, among orthopteran insects. And orthopterans refer to broadly, um, you know, grasshoppers and locusts. Um, as well as crickets and bush crickets. Uh, I don't work on grass, grasshoppers and locusts, although some other people do. Um, and on the, uh, uh, I work on, on crickets and bush crickets. And what are some of the ways that you tell these apart? Well, you know, you know what a grasshopper sort of looks like. Um, crickets and bush crickets look considerably different. One, mo one of the most obvious ways that you can tell the difference is that is that crickets tend to have very long antennae, which are not not sort of as long as the head, but as long as the entire body. So here is an example of a bush cricket, which is found almost all over India. And so I'm fairly sure you will have heard this animal. This is a, a beautiful video made by an undergraduate named Ronit of uh, calling by this animal. I'm hoping all of you can hear this, right? So you can see uh, how this animal is producing the call. Um, this is another point of difference between different kinds of orthopterans. These bush crickets as you can kind of see, if I play this again for you, can you see that it's kind of rubbing the, this sort of hardened portion of the two wings against each other? Uh, so this is uh, uh, one of the differences between, uh, you know, uh, crickets and, and, um, and grasshoppers and locusts. Um, as I said, uh, crickets and bush crickets tend to have these long kind of antennae, uh, whereas grasshoppers tend to have these short antennae, so about the, the size of the, the head. But why do we care about these differences between these animals? We care because it's a really interesting system to watch, the, to, to see um, and to observe multiple lineages in which one sees the evolution of different kinds of song and different kinds of um, and hearing. So while crickets and bush crickets rub together their wings to produce sound, as you kind of saw with that animal, um, you, uh, you uh, grasshoppers and locusts um, instead rub their hind legs against, um, uh, you know, um, sort of uh, uh, against a, a section of the abdomen against each other. So, so um, uh, they produce sound in very different ways. Um, despite all being related. So it's an interesting system in which to watch, to, to look at how uh, communication systems evolve. How they hear is also different between these two subsets of, of orthopterans. So um, crickets and bush crickets listen through a ear on the front legs, on the elbow. And I'll show you a close up of what that ear looks like, but it's kind of cool. Um, whereas, whereas grasshoppers and locusts listen through a ear, a tympanal organ that's located on the abdomen. So again, very different ways by which um, they hear and produce sound. So that's not all in terms of the interesting story. Um, within crickets and bush crickets, again, you see very different um, lineages that produce sound and hear sound. So this is an example, uh, you know, of one tree. This is a 1995 tree and uh, you know, there've been, uh, there's been some contestation of this tree more recently uh, to, to look at this question. But what is undisputed is that if you look among the cricket and bush cricket kind of group of organisms, um, you again, you know, it's not as if they all produce and hear uh, sound in the same ways. What you see is that there are certainly several lineages in which there's no sound produced and no hearing. Um, so if you look at these two traits, right, you see these two rows. Right, the uh, you know uh, the um, 
as you can see, it's sort of the, the colors of the rows uh, refer to the ways in which sound is produced. Um, so, uh, you know, um, this is rubbing the hind leg against uh, the abdomen, uh, which uh, one sees in, in um, you know, some kinds of, um, of uh, grasshoppers. Uh, and this rubbing of these two wings over each other, you see in some of these, uh, in some of these lineages, some lineages, you see a mixture, something that's called polymorphic. Um, and so you see a variety of different uh, combinations of ways in which sound uh, gets produced. And perhaps most uh, interestingly, you see this, um, uh, that crickets, um, you know, which are represented here on this tree and bush crickets, which and at least the ones that we work on are largely pseudophilines, so represented roughly speaking here on this tree, um, that these also produce sounds in slightly different ways. So when those wings rub against each other, what happens is actually that a something like a file, right, like a, a little bit like a comb uh, on one wing gets rubbed against a pick on the other wing. So in the same way, some of these musical instruments or really how it would sound if you were to take a comb and run your fingernail across it, right, there is this uh, you know, uh, this action of, of sort of rubbing uh, of, of sort of uh, a file against a, a comb, which produces a sound that sounds a little bit like krr, krr, krr. But then that sort of sets the whole wing in motion, especially parts of the wing that tend to vibrate, um, you know, in resonance with this, and that amplifies the sound uh, and sets it up. So it's a very cool calling mechanism. But as you can see, that calling mechanism is not universal among crickets. And it, in fact, evolves uh, in two lineages, one in which crickets tend to rub the right wing over the left. And this is not just sort of, a, uh, you know, something that um, uh, that is flexible in that one wing therefore has a tile uh, against which the other one rubs a pick, right? So crickets have a right wing over the left, and this is how the, the, the rubbing happens. And for bush crickets, it's the other way around. It's the left wing over the right, yeah? And then the, the, the big question that, of course, taxonomists try to figure out is, are these... Uh, shared by a common ancestor, and then were they lost in several of these lineages, especially because many of those lineages of crickets which don't have sound production and sound reception are crickets that are that bury, you know that that live underground in burrows um, and uh, you know uh, so spaces where possibly uh, auditory signals don't transmit in the same way as um, for above ground uh, orthopterans. So the big question, of course, is. Have there was there a, you know a common ancestor with sound production and sound reception of this kind, um, which with some lineages that lost um, hearing, or was there a common ancestor that did not have hearing and did uh, hearing and sound? So you know this is again uh, particularly interesting to us because it's a map system. You have no communication if you just have the production of sound and no reception of sound, uh, and vice versa, right? But uh, one sees both of these systems evolve, uh, uh, you know, uh, emerge both in, in crickets and bush crickets. And the question is, did they evolve independently um, in, in these lineages? So uh, the match between hearing, so, you know, in most cases you see that both hearing and sound production are there, but in some cases you see uh, examples where, um, you know, uh, you have one system, but not the other. So there are a few lineages where you see some interesting mismatches like this. And as you can see, there are some lineages that are that have clearly showed secondary loss of, of hearing and sound production, right? Uh, but nested in a, a wider group, which, which has these abilities. So certainly there is evidence for some losses of hearing and, um, uh, and sound production. And the big question is, you know, is there also, um, you know, um, uh, evidence for independent evolution of these? Yeah, so this is an ongoing sort of interesting question of interest to the field. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've done some work on one bush cricket that said, shed some light on these kinds of questions. And of course, there, there are more interesting questions and I'll introduce you to all of those with respect to this model system. Uh, but in this context, we've uh, largely worked on this gorgeous animal, um, uh, you know, which looks like a leaf. So this is why it's called a pseudophiline, false leaf. Um, and, um, uh, you know, this animal is, uh, uh, lives, uh, mates, uh, you know, poops and so on, everything, life happens on a jackfruit leaf. And this animal's wings are so beautifully uh, sort of camouflaged that um, they're actually, uh, they're very, very hard, hard to spot. They'll often, during the daytime, sandwich themselves between two leaves, in which case they're essentially invisible. 
And occasionally, if you kind of see a walking leaf, then that's one of these guys, but they, they also tend to not move around too much. So uh, one tends to not um, uh, see them, uh, you know, uh, very readily. Um, sometimes they look like sort of newly formed leaves, which are, which are just nested among, you know, older leaves. And if they do that, they can occasionally be spotted. And sometimes you see a leg emerging from a leaf and then, you know, it's one of these. Just beautiful animals with, as you can see, very, very long antennae. Um, and if you look at this picture, you can start to see where the year is located on these animals. So as, in the same way as the first slide that I showed you, these animals produce sound by rubbing those wings against each other. Um, they also do all kinds of really interesting behavior I'm not going to go into right now, um, including a fear response where they kick up their two legs and the, the two legs then look, make it look like this from, from, from the back. This is an animal with very large antennae. Uh, but um, uh, and it was a video that did the rounds on Facebook recently, and uh, you know people thought this was some very unusual animal, and I recognized that it was a nymph of this of this creature. Those little bumps on the forelegs, right below the elbow, those are the ears, right? And over here, you can kind of see a, a zoomed up uh, image of the ear, which looks like our ears, <laughs> except there's like a central stem and two kind of pinna-like structures uh, on either side. And it turns out that these animals actually have not mm -hmm. one. So we have one eardrum per year, two years, one eardrum each. This is the equivalent of having two years, one on each forearm, right? And within each year, they, as it turns out, and this is a CT scan that um, that a collaborator of ours did. Um, uh, you know, you see these very very thin membranes that disappear to uh, or that sort of. Uh, that go from the center of the stem to the back of the ear, and those are the two eardrums. So this animal has two eardrums. In most crickets and bush crickets, the second eardrum is what's is sort of a dud in the sense that it tends not to vibrate in response to sound. Uh, but when we figured when we tried to look at what was happening with our animals, uh, you know, this was part of the problem. Uh, the, the the answer to the problem that we found was quite interesting. Okay, so what are our problems in cricket communication? What are the, the questions that we want to work on? What are the difficult things to understand about the system? Well, there's a whole portion, there's a, I mean, there's a whole question of how sound is produced uh, by these wings, uh, but not just by the wings, but, but by, the, by the, the neural system that drives song production, right? Uh, and as you'll see in our more recent work, we're particularly interested in that part of this question. But there's also um, the question of how sound is heard. So, you know, the tympanum is the first stage or the first step of hearing. And then there's further, you know, there's more hearing that happens, uh, you know, after this. Um, uh, there's uh, auditory processing by the, the neural system. Um, there are responses to the, the sound. Um, and we're interested in, in the circuitry that governs all of that. The third problem that we look at is something called the cocktail party problem. Uh, <laughs> so the problem is that the cocktail party problem is defined by uh, has was was largely defined by people in the west who only existed in crowded contexts in a cocktail party for indians when you say cocktail party problem cocktail parties are one of the least crowded places which you can go to in india so for us people think what is this cocktail party problem how is it related to uh, what an animal might experience so if you're Indian, the equivalent of the cocktail party problem is just, I don't know, Kashmiri Gate bus stand or, uh, you know, even the metro. Where there are lots of people, it's very packed, there's a lot of conversation. And if the conversation is loud enough, people will have difficulty hearing one another. Right? So you might, you might actually be standing in front of a friend, they may be saying something, but you may have difficulty tracking who's saying what. And here's the thing. If you think about what the ear and the auditory system does, computations that you tend to largely ignore because of how uh, you know how easily your neural systems uh, are able to do this uh, um, uh, you know it's essentially a single eardrum upon which all sound sources impinge right so if you're around 20 people all their voices are converging upon a single eardrum if uh, there are uh, you know um, 200 people or a metro you know, train that's arriving and going plus various sources of noise. It's not uncommon for someone who's, you know, in Chandni Chowk or, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, some uh, crowded uh, market in, in, in Delhi to experience 200 sound sources all at the same time. And these are all impinging upon a single eardrum. Remember your 
auditory system is largely housed within your body with the, the only window to the outside world is one is, is two eardrums. The vibration of this, these, these eardrums, that single source of information <coughs> then undergoes extensive processing by your neural auditory system in order to, for your brain, produce a relatively seamless sense that even if you were to close your eyes, that there are 200 sound sources around me. I hear a halwai dukan over there. I hear a cycle rickshaw over here. Uh, you know, I hear somebody uh, asking us to step into his bangles shop over there. You know, you can you can place you know the uh, in in 3D space sources of sound jump out at you, and you're able to figure out. You're not only able to separate those sources of sound, but figure out who they are, um, figure out what they belong to, where they might be located in space. That entire uh, sense that we have of auditory, uh, you know, auditory sources in space uh, is based on very complicated calculations in the brain. And so we're interested in understanding how neural systems solve that problem. Uh, and that's the co cocktail party problem. Recognition of, uh, you know, of particular sources of sound amid noise. So the question, what is the cocktail party problem for an insect, right? That's the question you might ask. Uh, what's the insect equivalent of this? When do insects have to have to do this? And you know, if you are in a in a tropical rainforest, it can be so loud that you can't hear each other at night. Um, and you know, as I've said, all of you will have heard crickets and bush crickets calling at night when you're in a semi-rural area. And in some places, they can be quite loud. Right? I mean, there's the the joke about somebody who's from a city going to a village and just not being able to sleep because of all of the insects calling at night because they can actually be quite loud. And in a tropical rainforest uh, with high biodiversity, like the Western Ghats, where I started off uh, doing my postdoctoral fieldwork, um, fieldwork because I, you know, I after a PhD that was largely confined to a, a lab with white walls, I realized that I simply couldn't sustain uh, my love for biology until, unless my work involved a field component, where I was actually, you know, in the um, the kinds of biodiverse spaces that inspire me to do to do biology. Um, and so uh, the equivalent of this problem for these uh, in these areas is um, what do you do? How do you recognize one caller among a sea of hundreds of callers sometimes? We know that in these in, in Kudremuk National Park, we know uh, from uh, work done in the lab where I post up through any Balakrishnan's lab in CES that there are, uh, you know, we know all of the different callers. We know that there are up to 20 different callers. Um, uh, you know, species, orthopteran species alone, and of course, several other callers at night. You can have, you'll have frogs calling at night. You'll have, um, uh, you know, um, birds calling during the day, cicadas during the day. So you have various sources of sound at various times of the day. But the calling properties of uh, all of these uh, uh, callers, the loudness, the transmission, their positions, their seasons, their calling hours, all of these are well characterized in this in this situation. So the cocktail party problem is relatively well defined. And so for that same animal that we met uh, earlier, the one on top, a bush cricket with this relatively soft call, it will face a cocktail party problem, uh, a problem, the specific problem of being masked, its song being drowned. When it's singing next to one of the, the, the animal that you see below on the screen, which produces this very loud sound that drowns out the first one. And if you have further callers, this is a third species that I've started to play, then it becomes uh, prohibitively difficult. So that's uh, another question. There is a there are there are further questions that we try to understand. There are physics questions about how animals are able to localize a source of sound, especially when it's a low frequency call, which I might get into later. Um, so there are there are questions about how the animals overcome physical constraints with respect to the auditory space. Um, that's another question that we investigate in these animals. But the the most important question, or the the, the overall the, the the guiding uh, question for all of these, uh, as I said, is the question of how such a system evolves. Um, okay, so why did I end up choosing this bush cricket of among the the others? Well, there are I mean each animal in this ecosystem, um, uh, you know occupies a somewhat different space and Rohini's lab had you know done a fantastic job of characterizing the calling space um, and so our interest together was to look at the auditory system uh, and to look at call reception and hearing and what that looked like um, although as I said now I started to get interested in call production again but you know call call reception is one of the main uh, things that um, uh, that the system uh, that we were interested in at first we're particularly interested in this for this animal because its uh, evolutionary trajectory 
um, uh, you know, it comes from a uh, you know family of of bush crickets. Now I've spoken about crickets and bush crickets somewhat interchangeably so far, but perhaps it's useful for me to sort of make a distinction between these. Crickets tend to be uh, are typically what we we call ground crickets. They're animals that are that call from the ground. They tend to produce pure tone calls, and um, uh, these tend to be low frequency calls. Bush crickets tend to call from high up in the trees. They tend to produce produce these sounds like right these high frequency broadband calls um, from uh, from the forest. This is a bush cricket. Uh, it uh, comes from a, a lineage that produces, um, you know, high frequency broadband calls, but it has evolved to produce low frequency pure tone calls. So essentially, this is a bush cricket that sounds like a cricket. Um, and so our interest was in looking at the hearing system because uh, there was a hunch that if this is an animal that is uh, doing, uh, that is listening to, uh, you know, low frequency sounds that, um, uh, but, but has evolved from a high frequency lineage, that there might be interesting adaptations uh, to, the, to look at how the, the auditory system has evolved in concert with the call production system. Okay, so these animals produce, as I said, a narrow band, low frequency call. In fact, it's such a low frequency call that it actually avoids it, all the acoustic competition in the forest. It goes from being, you know, from, from, from being a very high frequency caller to being one of the lowest frequency callers in the forest. Um, so the question is, have the females auditory systems also evolved to show tuning around 3.2 kilohertz? This is the call. It's a beautiful low frequency call. Most of you will not have heard this, unlike the first song that I played to you. Bad animals common all across India, and this one is largely found specifically in the Western Ghats. Okay, the, some of the physical problems, as I said, that get produced by this is what I call the base note problem, which is that when these animals produce such low frequency calls, the question is how are they heard and how are they localized? Now, localization is particularly difficult when you are really tiny compared to the wavelength of the sound that you're listening to, right? Uh, and in the case of this particular animal, uh, the problem is one where, you know, in some sense, um, this also depends on the separation between your ears. Um, and so crickets and bush crickets in general um, are able to improve their uh, localization of, uh, or, or show an adaptation that um, effectively makes improves their ability to listen to uh, and localize low frequency sounds. They have multiple such adaptations. One such, of course, is just having the ears on your elbows instead of your head. Right the, on the head, the two ears are not very separate from one another. A lot of the solution to the cocktail party problem of figuring out where different callers are from involves comparing inputs that reach the two ears either in terms of their timing, in terms of when they reach the two years. So if, if a year reaches the sound this year first and that year later, the assumption is that it's closer to this part of the, uh, you know, to, closer to this year than to that. Uh, but of course, your resolution on this is limited if your years are very close together, right? Um, if the years are further apart, then you have somewhat uh, better resolution, at least of the space between. And, um, and so this, this uh, adaptation certainly helps crickets, uh, but uh, we uh, certainly thought that, uh, that this cricket might, might uh, we'll have to look at how this cricket solves that problem. Okay, so uh, I'll get into what we found, uh, you know, uh, when the animals, um, you know, uh, when we looked at the years of these animals a little bit later. But for now, uh, let me just tell you what happened when we did the behavioral experiments. Um, uh, when we just played the um, the, the call uh, that that I showed you earlier to uh, con specific animals. So this, as you can see, these are experiments done in low light. So they're done using IR uh, infrared, and soon you'll hear the sound, uh, the onset of the sound, and then you'll see how the animal responds. Uh, so when you look at this, uh, you're looking at the animals in the back, basically. As you can kind of see, the, the 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 legs are in the front, the animal's facing forward. You can kind of see the eye of the animal and the antenna very faintly. <laughs> um, that's the call. So you're seeing a response in the animal. I mean, for most of these animals, they hear the call and then they move towards the source of the call. This animal, for some reason, doesn't do that. And this was a surprise to us. Uh, uh, it's not a response that we understood at first. The animal just seems to sort of sit there and show these kind of like shuddering uh, orgasmic sort of uh, vibrations in response to um, the call. 
So we weren't sure what to do with this, and we actually ended up using a tool that we largely use for structural analysis of, of um, the years. Uh, we used it, we directed it towards the branch that the animal was sitting on just to see whether there was a vibrational component to um, these, um, a vibrational component to this, uh, this, uh, you know, this shaking. Is she essentially shaking the branch that she's uh, standing on? And so the way this works uh, is this is a laser vibrometer. So, you know, it's, uh, it sends a laser down to the branch on which the animal sits. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the laser gets reflected off and ideally you, you shine it on a surface that's perpendicular to it. And the perpendicular surface reflects the laser back. And this is what's called a Doppler laser vibrometer, which means it uses the Doppler effect to figure out what kind of vibration is happening. Now, you might have you might vaguely remember the Doppler effect from school. You may have totally forgotten it, which is fine. Uh, but in case you've forgotten it, it's this, it's this phenomenon where if you kind of remember, you probably have been uh, somehow this by the example of a train which is coming towards you as the train comes towards you. Uh, you know, uh, the frequency of the whistle seems to change, even though it's not changing at source, right? And this is because as uh, a sound emitting object comes towards you, the sound waves that it produces are getting compressed in space. As it moves away from you, they get uh, widened in space. So the wavelength sort of goes down and uh, when it's coming close and, and, and widens when it goes away. And that changes your perception of the effective frequency of the call, right? So, um, so likewise, when this uh, laser shines onto the branch, if the branch is vibrating while the laser shines onto it, uh, it acts like the train, right? It's not the source of the signal like the train is, but it is a reflector back of the laser, right? And depending on where, it, you know, if the branch is vibrating like this, as it reflects the laser, there will be a frequency shift depending on whether it's moving in this direction or moving in that direction. Right. And so that is the, the changed frequency of the laser is what the laser scanner kind of picks up when the laser comes back to it. And based on that, it figures out whether the, the object that it's being shone upon is moving or not. So when we use a laser vibrometer to see whether uh, what happens when the insect vibrates, we found this very, very nice kind of vibratory signal that she seems to be sending. And, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, we were tempted to then think of this actually as a duet, but a very unusual duet in the animal world, because usually duets all happen in the same modality. That is to say, when two birds duet, one chirps, the other one chirps, and so on and so forth, these tend to be in the same modality, right? Um, and uh, so you'll have, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, one bird calling, the other bird calling, but the exchange is in the same medium, right? A sound. Um, in this context, there is it, this is sort of like what happens when you might get a phone call from somebody and you can't take the phone call, so you send them an SMS instead. It's a response in a different mode, and in some sense, a secret mode compared to the mode in which the calls come in. So the 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 male's call in this species, the male is the one that does the calling, and the male call is acoustic. It's these chirps, tiri tiri and then in nice alternation with these chirps, you see the animals shake. So it's tiri shake shake, shake, which is hopefully something that you can also see when you look at the, the, the raw video, right? Um, uh, you can see this relationship with those animals. Okay, so, uh, you know, we started off wanting to understand how the female was responsive or tuned to the male call. Um, so, uh, you know, we uh, looked at uh, the spectrum of the male call, which is about peaks at 3.2 kilohertz. So I said very low frequency compared to um, other bush crickets. And we found, and you know, this, the fact that these animals produce these tremulations in response to sound, this, this female shaking is called tremulation. And the reason this is interesting is because, you know, it gives us a very unusual and interesting system in which to get a sense of how interested she is in the call. In most crickets and bush crickets, including this one, uh, you know, the females just usually get up and move towards the source of the call. Um, in this case, we see that the females sometimes eventually do that, but they spend a long period of time just duetting with the males. Now, uh, as I said, you know, uh, most duets are unimodal, all happen in the same mode. There can be multimodal courtship. So you, I, I'm sure you've seen these videos, for example, of these birds which can court uh, females and then the females will sometimes flash a wing to indicate interest. But those aren't duets, right? There'll be co brief courtship signals um, that can happen in different modes from uh, the mode through which courtship happens. 
but um, uh, but this is uh, sort of unusual as a as a multimodal duet, and this duet can go on for a while. So the question is, why is she sending him a signal? Is it just to sort of indicate her interest? Um, uh, you know, uh, why should she show her interest when she could just go over there and start the process of mating, which is presumably what this, I mean, we know that these are calls that are produced uh, to uh, as advertisement calls to attract a mate. So why not just begin, you know, walk over there and begin the mating process? So we had a bunch of questions. We wanted to know whether the males could find the females, whether, um, you know, um, uh, various questions like that. Um, but our initial interest of trying to understand how the call sort of um, specificity of the female had evolved for such a low call frequency of the male uh, <laughs> was easily answered by this because we were able to generate frequency variants of this call and play it to the female and get a sense of how much she tremulated compared to the natural call. And as you can see, when she's not super interested, her tremulations can become small or sometimes even non-existent. So the tremulation is a nice response you know, this whole thing takes, as you can see, this is a time scale of seconds. So you get about one call and response per second. So with just a minute's worth of recording, you get 60 responses to song. And so it's a nice, uh, statistically robust way of, of getting a sense of how interested she can be in different types of calls. Whereas with and with uh, crickets and bush crickets that just move towards the source of sound, you just have a binary output, right? They move or don't move. And in order to come up with more complicated ways to, to sort of to nuance a sense of the degree of interest in a call, uh, and uh, you know, experimenters have typically needed to set up a trackball, uh, you know, on which the animal keeps moving towards the source of sound, doesn't reach there, and they look at the angle and the trajectory of movement towards the source of the sound in order to quantify interest in a call. In our case, we didn't have to do that at all. We just have this beautiful sort of tuning curve uh, that shows, um, you know, um, the, the spectrum of uh, female tremulation with respect to spectrally altered calls, and you find a beautiful band pass. Uh, you know, she she has, uh, um, you know, she shows a beautiful kind of band pass interest in this call. Um, maximum, uh, you know, tremulation to uh, an artificial call at the uh, at the same peak frequency as the as the male, uh, and lowered but still existent interest for up to you know two kilohertz and four kilohertz, uh, but. At five, you know, the the the, the sort of uh, you know one kilohertz plus minus seems to be uh, the bandwidth of this uh, tuning, and uh, between around one and five kilohertz, uh, her reaction is next to zero. Okay, what about her ears? We use the same uh, laser Doppler vibrometer, but a, a more much more expensive version um, to answer this question, uh, and this involves shining the laser onto the ear. That's the ear seen somewhat close up. That's the foot. So the animal is kind of immobilized and the, the, the foot is immobilized. That's just clay that we've put around it uh, while we play sounds. So we play sounds to the ear. The eardrum vibrates and the laser Doppler, Doppler vibrometer is able to give you, a, as long as you align it to be perpendicular to that, that tympanum, it gives you a sense of whether the tympanum is moving towards or away from the laser. Right? This is the laser's the laser has camera on it as well. So you can see the laser eye view. So we have, uh, we found that, uh, so remember this animal has two tympana. So we were looking at both. And, um, you know, we, uh, you know, you, you can see that the whole tympanum kind of moves. So green and red are different sort of uh, phases. So you can see that the, the, the tympanum is sort of anchored at the edges, but it can move out like a piston, the whole thing moves out, just like you'd imagine for our eardrums. For us, this is an unsurprising result, right? You expect a eardrum would vibrate like a drum, but in fact, cricket ears can sometimes show all kinds of interesting ways that it responds. The, the whole eardrum doesn't always move in the same way, et cetera, et cetera. So, so uh, even though this is an unsurprising result, if you're just uh, used to human ears, uh, it's not, it, it is, it is, um, um, one of several possibilities for how a tympanum can respond to sound. But you can see that this is fairly straightforward. The, the ear moves, I say, in and out, in and out, right, uh, in response to sound. But if you play different frequencies of sound to it, the same thing that we did with the whole animal, right? With the whole animal, you find that it responds to, you know, it's band pass around the, the call. The eardrum is not band pass. The eardrum uh, doesn't show a decrease in responsiveness to lower frequency calls compared to 3.2 kilohertz, which is the peak frequency of the male call. But above 3.2 kilohertz, you see a very sharp reduction in responsiveness. 
What does that mean? It means that you're playing three kilohertz songs to the animal and the eardrum, uh, not even songs, just tones, and the, the eardrum is vibrating. And for higher frequency, the eardrum is not even like taking any customers, you know, it's just dukan band kar diya. The eardrum is just not responsive. It's materially not responsive to higher frequency songs. Interesting. So even before sound reaches the, the ear, you see that the eardrum is not representing or uh, transmitting, this eardrum is not representing or transmitting uh, sounds which are above 3.2 kilohertz. Okay. Um, and it's really interesting how beautifully, uh, you know, one sees this very sharply naturally selected filter because that, can you see that little portion there? That is the, is where the, um, that is, the, this is again frequency, that's some other attribute which is the, uh, reflects the temporal pattern of the sound. But 3.2 kilohertz is the, um, uh, the sound of the, of our, of our bush cricket. These are all of the other crickets in the forest. So every animal has a different symbol here. This is data produced by, um, by other folks in, in um, Rohini's lab. Uh, but very, very uh, beautifully, you see that, you know, um, that our, and, you know, cricket is, bush cricket is almost one of the lowest frequency callers in the forest. And this sharp, the frequency at which you, you see a steep drop off in sensitivity is the frequency that separates our animals call from all the other callers in the forest. So the so the tympanal membrane, one of the two tympanal membranes in the ear, is just responding to calls which are lower than or equal to our bush cricket song. Remember, this is particularly interesting that it's what's called what we call a low pass filter. It's letting lower frequencies through and not higher frequencies. Now. This is interesting because it comes from a frequency of very high high frequency callers. So our guess is that its closest ancestor would not show this, although that's something that we have yet to investigate. Okay, so the anterior tympanal membrane tunes out most of the heterospecific ambient noise of the rainforest. Right? And you see this beautiful match between structure, behavior, and ecology. Right, and we're we're now uh, adding neural information to this. Um, that's some of the work that I'm interested in recruiting students to work with uh, me on. So this is uh, this is just a line connecting the peak of behavioral um, responses, the uh, point at which the uh, the structural the structure of the ear starts to filter out sounds, and the sort of mean um, sort of frequency of the male call. Um, uh, relative to other callers in the forest. Okay, um, you probably have a lot of questions. Uh, you know, I'll I'll tell you what we found when we when we asked some of those and answered some of those. And I'm interested in then taking a lot more questions. One question is, if you're just not listening to you know, lots of callers in the in the forest, which is a particularly treacherous thing, especially when you're in a forest with a whole bunch of bats, predatory bats in it. And one of the things that high frequency calling animals in the top reaches are able to do is that they're able to hear high frequencies. Uh, and that's very helpful with detecting when predatory bats are around. So the question is, can this, an does this animal, is this animal not even just listening to anything that's higher frequency than itself? It turns out that this, as I said, with, with most animals, uh, they have two tympanum per year and one tympanum kind of functions while the other one does not. So what is the other tympanum doing? Uh, in this context, we know that the other tympanum is, uh, you know, is actually uh, responding to higher frequencies. So it's a very neat system of differential tympana, which we've not, it's a very unusual system again. Uh, so this animal is behaviorally unusual, structurally unusual, and there's a whole bunch of other structural unusual sort of stories, which I'm not telling here, uh, including about how the, um, the, the, um, the eardrums are structured, how directionality is calculated and so on and so forth. But a very neat system because you have one tympanum that's listening to all frequencies, one tympanum that is shutting out everything that's higher than the conspecific call uh, and so on. So for neural responses right now, we just do whole, um, you know, uh, we're just doing sort of uh, hook rec uh, electrode recordings, whole cell recordings uh, from these ascending nerves, right? Which is uh, over the hook here um, from the thorax of the animals. Um, we know that, uh, you know, these animals barely show any responses to, to low frequency calls, but they show very, very clear uh, and strong responses to very high frequency calls. Uh, 
um, you know, in fact, that was, um, uh, those were just 30 kilohertz uh, calls, which we showed you, but in fact, they're able to, uh, you know, we, we see, and perhaps, yeah, here we go. Um, we see that um, uh, there are, you know, this is a bat call and you see very clear responses of um, these very large cells um, in the ascending nerve uh, to high frequency calls. So these animals, uh, you know, are clearly with that posterior temporal and membrane listening to high frequency callers, including predators, and with the anterior temporal membrane are listening to the conspecific call. And it's also interesting because uh, in most of these bush crickets, there is uh, you know, the largest cell, the fastest cell, therefore, uh, these are myelinated fibers um, in the system are listening to high frequency calls, um, bat calls, and presumably mediating avoidance responses. So we're studying what some of those avoidance responses look like with respect to predatory bats, uh, predatory bat calls, uh, and how their responses are, are you know, change <laughs> in response to such calls. Uh, but in addition, uh, we see a very cool, um, uh, you know, uh, I haven't shown these data here, but, but you know, when you play even higher frequency calls, 80 kilohertz calls, you still see them uh, responding to, to such high frequencies. Um, tremulation in turn, that, that, that uh, you know, that shaking behavior is possibly, uh, possibly evolved in the context of bat predatory pressure, because this this kind of shaking the vibratory response to song is essentially being transmitted along the substrate, along a medium where bats cannot eavesdrop. While it is in fact known that bats do eavesdrop upon cricket calls, and as I said, these animals are very, very hard to find. So they, they are easy to spot by, by echolocating or even gleaning bats if they are moving. They're visually easy to spot as well, because these bats, uh, we know that uh, these moving bats use visual, visual response, low light visual responses as well. But if the female moves towards the male, right, uh, in previous work, it's been found that 100% of, of tethered flying females are localized and eaten by predatory bats, right? Um, this is um, uh, work by Raghuram and, and Balakrishnan showing that, that only, a, a, you know, some, some calling males are eaten, 100% of tethered flying females are eaten. And so if the females aren't moving, but are just, um, you know, producing the signal, which the males can localize, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, I'm not going to show you all of that, those data, but, but the males are able to respond to these vibratory signals, they're able to move towards the source of that call. In fact, their responses are very specific, because they, um, uh, you know, they, they're able to hear the call and respond, uh, they're able to uh, sense vibration and localize vibration and move towards a source of vibration. But they'll only do it if it arrives in response to their own call. So that, uh, you know, also provides some interesting insight into the possible circuit that mediates these kinds of responses. Um, so I'm just going to um, move ahead very quickly to say that uh, some of the ways in which this system is recognized is um, uh, is we we realize we think that the, the relative phase of the duet makes a big difference to uh, male recognition of the female vibratory stimulus. So um, the males call, uh, the females vibrate, and between male calls, if you represent the the distance, the time between males male male calls as one full cycle, the fem a, a given female has an extremely high, this is a vector sum of the timing of her responses. The fidelity of the timing of her responses is very high. But each one of these arrows represents a different female. So different females have slightly different timings with which they, uh, they respond. But um, they, they do not, but a given female seems to respond at a very specific time after the onset of the call. So, uh, you know, we're now also doing experiments looking at the, the relative timing of these two things. How much of her response does it take for him to recognize that she has vibrated? Uh, how much of the call is she perceiving before she, before this, this response begins and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to skip ahead uh, really quickly. Uh, not. Uh, will not quite have time to show you everything that the male does. Um, but I'll just say that these males therefore do not respond to just the female's vibratory stimulus if we if we simulate it using a piezo um, on the branch. Uh, he only responds to her stimulus if it arrives within a certain time period, either of him calling or of another male calling. And this is very interesting because it means that males are not just listening to or sensitive to female vibratory responses to their own calls, but they're willing to, they're responsive to females who are vibrating in response to another male's calls. Um, and we're now also looking at questions of um, 
satellite strategies among these males and whether males are largely not, you know, not calling themselves, but, but listening to other, um, uh, you know, <laughs> callers uh, uh, and so on. We find that in a group of 10 males or so, which are all near each other, most of them don't call. A couple call, um, one or two at the most call, and then uh, these other satellite males will still try and intercept females who um, are moving towards that male. How does the female system uh, auditory system process directional information? Well, there's an, uh, another whole story there uh, looking at the, the trachea and how, um, um, uh, how the trachea shows selectivity for, um, for the call. Uh, I'm aware that I'm somewhat running out of time, so I'm going to I'm going to wrap this up pretty quickly. Uh, but I will just uh, but I will just say that, you know, um, these are CT scans of the animals showing that, the, you know, these animals have a particularly interesting system because you and I have a eardrum which is open to the world on one side, but on the other side, it's closed, right? I mean, the, it impinges on the auditory canal on the other side um, on these bones, which impinge upon the auditory canal in, in the in the anim, in the mammalian system. In um, these crickets, it's, there's actually a ear-filled passage that backs the, the eardrum, right? So the eardrum's here. Behind it is, a, is an air-filled pa uh, passage that actually opens up on the side. Uh, so okay. in fact, um, you uh, find a, a system in which can, can um, the... I think there's some sound. Uh, anyway, all right. Um, so uh, you see this very nice system where the, uh, you know, the... the um, Every eardrum is not just getting sound from the outside world directly, but sound through these passages <coughs> onto the inside of the tympanum. Uh, <coughs> and that by itself can make even a single eardrum directional because obviously the eardrum will respond somewhat differently to sound which is directly impinging on it and sound which is say closer to the back of the body, which may impinge on it with higher intensity through the back of the, through this air passage and onto the back of the eardrum. But then you need fairly sophisticated neural um, circuitry that can make sense in some sense or interpret these, this information that's possibly encoded uh, in how the eardrum responds to sound. So that's another uh, neural system under investigation. So <coughs> in temporary conclusion, we see these nice matched ear filters structurally and this novel kind of partitioning of frequencies between two tympana per year. We see matched tracheal passages, these kinds of long resonant tube type uh, trachea backing the ear of the kind that transmit low frequency pure tone song well, uh, rather than classical bush cricket type horn shaped high pass transmission filter types. Um, we see matched behavior, band pass behavioral tuning, and uh, this sort of again, novel finding on the way or multimodal duet. And uh, neural tuning uh, showing actually largely predator sensitivity um, in the system. And a lot of neural circuitry that remains to be understood, including the circuit that underlies tremulation behavior, uh, spectrally mediated acoustic, acoustic call recognition, uh, vibrational signal recognition, localization, all of these um, uh, we're working on. We're also uh, looking for people who are interested in working on another system, and that is this very cool system called Micopoda. This is actually the, the a green morph of the same animal as the one that I showed you in the first slide. And we're interested in call production in this animal because it's a very, very neat system in which um, you see multiple morphs, all looking identical, all in the same, calling in the same time, in the same place, in the same season. So to your eyes, it looks like a bunch of animals that are the same species and they've, you know, so far been thought of as a single species. But a given, and we don't know what the identities of the females are, but a given male will produce only one of five different song types. And so we are we think there's a really nice system in which we're actually seeing the emergence of complicated songs, right? And this is one of the complicated songs uh, produced by this animal. There is a simple call consisting of just repeated chirps. There is a, a next level complexity consisting of pairs of chirps. There's a third song consisting of long chirp, short chirp, long chirp, top chirp, uh, short chirp. <coughs> and then you have an incredibly complex song, which I'm playing to you right now, which consists of a long series of chirps of varying degrees of length, leading to a long trill. <coughs> so this is a complex song that has emerged in the Kudrimuk, um, uh ecosystem 
in this particular sort of uh, mode. So these five different call types are, um, uh, you know, uh, produced, uh, you know, in um, and, and we're interested in, in, in understanding how these call uh, these call types are produced and how they they evolve. And I'm not going to play all of these for you, but I'll just give you a quick uh, uh, indication that, you know, the call production system has been nicely figured out in crickets, um, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, and I, and I won't go into the, the details of this, but I'm happy to uh, later if you like. But we know that, uh, you know, some of these, uh, some of the ways in which call recognition happens in this animal does not involve the same temporal pattern. Um, recognition is spectrally based. Uh, we know that uh, call production and its evolution for complex sound production is a particularly interesting system to work on. So that's what we're doing next in uh, hopefully in collaboration with the people who did this, uh, this last work that I showed you. Okay, so I'll just end by saying we do have longer term questions of various kinds. Uh, what are the selective forces shaping the evolution of these of neural systems in general? And the co-evolution between sound production and sound reception systems in particular. Are there genetic links? We're interested in answering this, although we've really not, I've, it's been a long time since so I've done any genetic work. So if, if there are students who are interested in neurogenetics who are interested in this question, do get in touch. Um, we're interested in how speciation might or might not be happening between these five different song types, what female preference looks like, um, what is the neural basis of, of estimation of uh, temporal patterns in songs and of time more generally. And now we're also interested in other quantitative uh, forms of quantitative perception and quantitative uh, and economic cognition in animal model systems. I'll give you an example um, of some work that we're doing with zebrafish now. Um, so that's another system that we work on, although although lots of people are interested in that. So, so we're well staffed on that front. So I'd like to acknowledge my ongoing uh, grants, the DST CRG grant, as well as past grants, the DST Inspire and Kothari Fellowships my annual research grant from Ashoka, my collaborators um, and uh, students at Ashoka. Um, uh, you know, this is the fish system that we work on. Um, I'll, I'll maybe uh, introduce that later to you where we're trying to understand how fish make choices, uh, quantitative choices. Um, Arini, Manoj uh, uh, and Riban all work on the cricket system as do some of these uh, undergrads, Shweta, uh, Shagun, um, Tara, uh, Shreya, and uh, these are all the and uh, folks who work on the fish system. Guru kind of works on all of these systems, as does Anubhav. Um, you know, Abhishek uh, and now Nawaf work on the fish system uh, along with Kajal, uh, Palashi, uh, Tanya, uh, Ameya, and so on. 